In April 1775, American militia launched a devastating attack on the British troops in Boston. It was the beginning of a revolution against Britain and of a civil war between American rebels and colonials loyal to the crown. The British struck back and fought with discipline and bravery, but less than a year later were forced to withdraw, making Boston the first American city lost to King George. In 1776, New York was central to the British administration of its American colonies and a stronghold of American loyalists. Here, Britain will make a stand. If you pick up an American paper today, you can be hard pressed to find the foreign news section. But if you bought your paper here on Broadway 225 years ago, the cobbled streets would have been British and most of the news in your paper would have been British too. Most New Yorkers knew more about what was happening in London, six weeks sailing away, than they did about events in neighboring Connecticut. When in the momentous summer of 1776, the 13 disparate colonies declared themselves independent, they also prepared for war. The new Continental Congress formed a regular army under the command of General George Washington and ordered him to prepare the troops and equipment to defend New York. Soldiers were at this time enlisting for a year's service. I didn't like that. It was too long a time for me at the first trial. I wished only to take a priming before I took upon me the whole coat of paint for a soldier. Joseph Plum Martin was a 15-year-old Connecticut boy. He saw the call to arms as a way of escaping chores on his grandparents' farm. He kept a diary of his adventures. One evening, I went off with a full determination to enlist. The old bantering began. Come, if you will enlist, I will, says one. You have long been talking about it, says another. Thinks I to myself, I will not be laughed into it or out of it. At any rate, I will act my own pleasure. Tom Martin was typical of this fledgling army. Young, naive, unframed and pitifully ill-equipped to face the discipline and experience of British regulars and their German comrades. I took up the pen, loaded it with the fatal charge, made several mimic imitations of writing my name, but took a special care not to touch the paper with the pen, until an unlucky white who was leaning over my shoulder gave my hand a stroke, which caused the pen to make a woeful scratch on the paper. Oh, he has enlisted, said he. He has made his mark. He is fast enough now. Well, thought I, might as well go through with the business now. Plum Martin decided to give army life a six-month trial. Congress only required men to enlist for a short time, six months or a year. And one of Washington's real problems was simply keeping an army together. Often, as soon as a man was trained, he'd be heading home to bring in the harvest. Even so, Washington scraped together 19,000 regular soldiers and local volunteers, the militia, to defend New York City. He had little joy finding recruits in the city itself. It was the heartland of support for the crown. New Yorkers loved all things British, including the luxury goods that still had to be imported. The arrival of a British fleet drew the crowds and was usually the signal for a shopping spree. Fashions, silver and Wedgwood china. But when 200 ships were sighted off New York in the summer of 1776, they carried a very different cargo. 30,000 soldiers from Canada and England the largest seaborne force Britain had ever mustered. 
to one observer, the fleet appeared like a forest of trimmed pine trees. The British were led by Admiral Richard Howe and his brother, General William Howe. Together, they intended to bring the American rebels back into the embrace of King George III. There's a conviction, certainly on the part of the Howe brothers, Lord Howe commanding the fleet and Billy Howe commanding the army, that ultimately this is going to be sorted out over a glass of Madeira and a bit of cake. On board the flagship was the Admiral's secretary, Ambrose Searle. He recorded in his diary the British attitude to the American rebellion. The rebels appeared very numerous and are supposed to be near 30,000. But from the mode of raising them, no great matters are to be expected, especially when their loose discipline is considered. But the rebels were by no means representative of all Americans. Here in New York, perhaps two-thirds of citizens were against independence. Some felt that it was a betrayal of allegiance to their king, and others feared that they lose out financially with the severing of economic ties with Great Britain. The British were determined to strengthen the Loyalists' hand and stop their persecution by the rebels. We learned the deplorable situation of His Majesty's faithful subjects. How they had been hunted after and shot at in the woods and swamps to which they had fled for these four months to escape the savage fury of the rebels. With the awesome power of the fleet displayed, General Howe gave Washington a chance to pull back from the brink. He didn't want to crush men who'd been his allies just 13 years before in the war against the French. Howe sent a letter offering peace if the rebels backed down. But General Washington took exception to it. As the address was to George Washington Esquire, they said there was no such person among them and therefore would not receive it. Standing on ceremony over titles may seem trivial, but it typified the impasse between the two sides. If Howe wrote to General Washington, then in a sense, he was recognizing the Continental Army and with it, America's right to self-rule. He tried to get round the problem by readdressing the letter to George Washington Esquire, etc., etc., etc which he said could imply everything. Washington replied that it could imply everything or anything and the letter remained unanswered. They have uniformly blocked up every avenue to peace. There now seems no alternative but war and bloodshed which must lay at the door of these unhappy people. You can see why the British picked New York. In addition to its loyalist power base, it's got one of the best and deepest natural harbors in the world. And as a collection of islands, it favors a navy, something the Americans didn't have. Although the city's grown up a bit, its geography is still clear. Old New York was on the tip of Manhattan Island, south of Wall Street. On the right is the East River, with Long Island on the far side. Over there is the mighty Hudson, which separates Manhattan from the New Jersey mainland. If the British could gain control of Manhattan, they could sail a hundred miles up the Hudson into the heart of rebel territory. In 1776, transport between the islands of New York was by boat. Washington had no idea where Howe was going to attack, so he took the risky decision to split his forces. He left some to guard Manhattan and ferried the rest over the East River to the Brooklyn Heights on Long Island. You can still see why Washington wanted the Brooklyn Heights. They're the ideal artillery position to protect Manhattan. A cannonball went much further if it was fired downhill and heavy guns up here could reach all the way to the coast. Equally, if Howe had control of the position, he could shoot right across Manhattan, as far as the Hudson River on the far side, and make it quite impossible for the Americans to stay in the city. 
the American fortifications on Brooklyn Heights were protected from behind by a five-mile stretch of wooded hills, dissected by small roads. The Americans guarded the three main passes, but overlooked the distant Jamaica Pass. Howe's plan was brilliantly conceived and perfectly executed. While decoy attacks were made on the main roads, the bulk of the army slipped round through the Jamaica Pass, realizing that they risked being cut off from their fortifications on the Brooklyn Heights. Most of the Americans fled through swamps and creeks. The rebels abandoned every spot as fast, I should say faster, than the King's troops advanced upon them. One of their officers did indeed make an attempt to form a considerable line of them in a ploughed field, but they had scarce formed when down came the troops upon the ground and the poltroons ran in the most broken, disgraceful and precipitate manner at the very first fire. Joseph Plum Martin was among reinforcements sent to Long Island. By the time we arrived, the enemy had driven our men into the creek. When they came out of the water and mud to us looking like water rats, it was a truly pitiful sight. Many of them were killed in the pond, more were drowned. Some of us went into the water after and took out a number of corpses and a great many arms that were sunk. Those Americans who made it back to Brooklyn were expecting another attack almost by the hour. They were sitting targets with the East River behind them and the British in front. Incredibly, there was no attack. Howe was hesitating. On the third night, Washington was rowed across from Manhattan to supervise a secret evacuation. It might almost have been the inspiration for Dunkirk. With the help of local boatmen, all the American army, with its equipment and guns, was ferried across to Manhattan under the cover of a timely sea fog. When the Redcoats finally arrived, there was barely a trace of the rebels. Howe's delay was so surprising that one American commander commented, Howe must be our friend, or no general. So why did Howe hesitate? Perhaps he was remembering his losses at Bunker Hill the year before. Or perhaps he was hoping that Washington would surrender so that he wouldn't have to crush the rebellion by force, making reconciliation impossible. In any event, he didn't show that killer instinct and lost a good opportunity of bringing the war to a swift, if bloody, conclusion. The naval superiority of the British had given them a great advantage in the battle for New York. So the Americans decided to target British ships by stealth from below. This is the Turtle, the world's first combat submarine. Designed by David Bushnell of Connecticut, it was used to attack British shipping in New York Harbor. It's an ingenious thing, with just room enough for one submariner. There are two hand-cranked propellers to enable it to move backwards and forwards and up and down to maneuver beneath an enemy vessel. Inside, there's a cork bobbing up and down in a tube to register depth, and it was lit by phosphorescent fungi. This spike was to be screwed into the hull of an enemy vessel. The turtle would then disengage, leaving this keg of explosives attached to the enemy by a rope. There was some sort of timing device. The turtle's maiden voyage was on the 6th of September, 1776. Its plucky sailor was Ezra Lee. He got right underneath the British flagship, HMS Eagle, but hit metal, not wood, and couldn't attach the bomb. He had to jettison it, and it caused a huge explosion. This gave the British such a scare that they shifted the whole fleet. But New York fell. As the Americans pulled out of Manhattan, fire engulfed the city. St. Paul's Chapel on Broadway was barely saved from the conflagration. Its vicar, the Reverend John Howard, 
says that it has a remarkable place in American history. The church was new then. It had just been built in 1766, and the Great Fire 1776 destroyed most of what was then the city of New York, everything from this point down to the lower end of Manhattan. The citizens of New York so highly regarded this structure and were so proud of it that they assembled bucket brigades and surrounded it and prevented this particular church, uh, St. Paul's Chapel, from burning. Recently, the chapel survived another tragedy, the collapse of the Twin Towers right beside it. For Reverend Howard, St. Paul stands as a symbol of religious tolerance in America, in striking contrast to the state religion of Imperial Britain, yet another source of friction between the colonists and the mother country. America had been um, exposed to religion not just through established churches, not just through state churches, such as the Church of England or the Roman Catholic Church in continental Europe, but had learned its religion from traveling itinerant preachers. And it was an environment in, in which each individual was free to choose uh, for himself the faith that he would follow. We could say that all armies believe that God is on their side. Do you think that the revolutionaries really did? Absolutely. My impression is that in the case of Washington, as in the case of most of the rest of his colleagues, his comrades in arms at that time, that faith, an ongoing personal relationship with God, was deeply held, deeply important, absolutely fundamental to them in the carrying on of their public duties. Faith in God and faith in the cause would be tested to the limit following the retreat from New York. That green mass over there is Central Park, and it gives a good idea of what this part of Manhattan used to look like. During their retreat, the Americans were using Indian tracks down the right-hand side of the park, and the British were just a spitting distance away on the other. But Howe didn't cut off the retreat. Some witnesses suggest that he was preoccupied with looking for suitable winter quarters. Billy Howe was a brave man, and no fool. But he'd let another golden opportunity of trapping Washington slip through his fingers. On a ship in New York Harbor, Admiral Howe's secretary saw the American retreat as cowardice. Nothing terrifies these people more than the apprehension of being surrounded. Well, they will not fight at any rate, unless they're sure of a retreat. Retreat certainly wasn't a dirty word as far as George Washington was concerned. Given the strength of his opponent, it was a positive military strategy. He was like a boxer, ducking and weaving, trying to avoid the knockout blow. He rarely attacked and tried to accept battle only on his own terms. He knew that his best chance of winning the war was to build up the strength of his own army and gradually wear down the enemy army on a foreign soil. But the retreat from Manhattan was panicky and disorganized. To Washington's anger, many raw recruits abandoned vital supplies, ammunition, tents, food and clothing. It left them little with which to face the coming winter and no safe place to rest for long. Joseph Plum Martin was becoming disillusioned with army life. It now began to be cool weather, especially the nights. To have to lie on the cold and often wet ground without a blanket and with nothing but thin summer clothing was tedious. I have often, while upon guard, lain on one side until the upper side smarted with cold, then turned that side down to the place warmed by my body and let the other take its turn at smarting. Perhaps it would rain all night like a flood. All that could be done in that case was to lie down, take the musket in our arms, and place the lock between our thighs and weather it out. The Americans surrendered Fort Washington and 3,000 men. They retreated into New Jersey and abandoned Fort Lee and more supplies. They commandeered food and clothing from the locals but found them unsupported. Many didn't want to take sides. Others were deeply opposed to the revolution. The inhabitants here were almost entirely what were termed Tories. 
An old lady of whom I often procured milk used always when I went to her house to give me a lecture about my opposition to good King George. She had always said she told me that the regulars would make us fly like pigeons. I was not afraid of her poisoning the milk. She had not wit enough to think of such a thing, nor resolution enough to do it. The Continental Army fell back through New Brunswick and Princeton. The Redcoats pursuing them said it was like a game of hide-and-seek. Winter fighting was unusual in the 18th century. And on the 14th of December, Howe called off the hunt and retired to New York City with his officers. It was the signal for ten days of parties and balls to celebrate the Christmas season. It also gave him the chance to spend some time with his mistress, the wife of his prison commissioner. A ditty ran, Sir William he, snug as a flea, lay all this time a-snoring, nor dreamt of harm, as he lay warm in bed with Mrs. Loring. Things weren't so cosy for Washington's army. They didn't have enough food, clothes, boots or shelter. Morale was at rock bottom, and there were so many desertions that Washington had to post guards to prevent people from leaving. His army was down to 5,000 men, and soon he would have no army at all. Enlistments were coming to an end. Plum Martin was one of the first to be released. Here ends my first campaign. I learned something of a soldier's life. Enough, I thought, to keep me at home for the future. Indeed, I was then fully determined to rest easy with the knowledge I had acquired in the affairs of the army. But the ease of a winter spent at home caused me to alter my mind. The 31st of December, just a few weeks away, was the release date for most of his troops. Washington told his brother that unless a new army could be enlisted, the game would pretty much be up. He had to do something spectacular to prove that the army was worth reviving or watch the revolution crumble. It was just a question of when and where. The Americans, with the British and their German allies in pursuit, didn't stop running until they'd passed Trenton and crossed the Delaware into Pennsylvania, where they felt safe to stop. As soon as Washington reached the Delaware, he seized or destroyed all the boats for miles around. This prevented the British from following him and also gave him transport for surprise attack. These are 40-foot Durham boats, normally used for transporting pig iron to Philadelphia. As cargo boats, they were ideal for moving cannon, horses and men. Trenton was now occupied by German troops, known as Hessians. They were formidable professional soldiers, hired by George III from his royal relatives in Germany. The Hessians were particularly hated by the Americans, who regarded them as mercenaries, interfering in a foreign war. They were under the command of Colonel Johann Rau. The moment was right. While the Hessians were celebrating Christmas, Washington's men were being primed for a counter-offensive. As they waited across the Delaware, officers read them a specially written speech by Thomas Paine to remind them what they were fighting for. It was called American Crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the Sunshine Patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. But the Americans were betrayed. A spy took a warning to Colonel Rao. Up and help us. Lay your shoulders to the wheel. Let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet and repulse him. 
The letter warned Ral of an attack that very night, but he decided to finish his game before reading it. My cowardice and submission, the sad... If Ral read the note now, Washington's plan would be ruined. The American army faced potential disaster. Without safety, slavery without hope. Our homes turned into barracks and body houses for the Hessians. And a future race to provide for whose fathers we shall doubt of. Look on this picture and weep over it. And if there remains one thoughtless wretch who believes it not, let him suffer it unlamented. Raoul drank late into the night. He didn't read the note. Washington planned three simultaneous crossings of the Delaware. But even the journey presented huge risks. The 25th of December was a filthy night with lashing sleet. The river was swollen and full of small ice floes which crashed into the boats as they crossed. It was so dangerous that only Washington's men got across. He would fight the battle at half strength. This crossing has become enshrined in American history. The Americans marched into Trenton as it was getting light, hours later than planned. But they still managed to surprise the guards. Rao, who was sleeping heavily after a night of heavy drinking, could hardly be roused. This monument was built to commemorate the spot where Washington's troops placed their cannon. From this height, you can see the clear line of fire the cannons had down Old King and Old Queen Streets. As the Hessians poured out of their lodgings to meet the attack, they were bowled over like skittles. Within an hour, the Hessians had surrendered and the Americans took 900 prisoners. Colonel Rahl was mortally wounded. The Americans suffered only a handful of casualties. Trenton was a small victory, but it was crucial. It showed that the Americans still had the ability to inflict real damage on their enemies. Washington now had a victory. But did he have an army? His men were counting the hours to their discharge. The general begged them to stay, but not one man came forward. The revolution was hanging in the balance. You have done all I asked you to do, and more than can be reasonably expected. But your country is at stake. Your wives, your houses, and all that you hold dear. You have worn yourselves out with fatigues and hardships, and we know not how to spare you. We are facing the crisis which is to decide our destiny. His men answered the call. It was perhaps Washington's most important achievement so far. The Continental Army would survive. Don't drop them! You have another one too! Plenty to go around. These small successes generated new enthusiasm for the cause, at home and abroad. Gently, gently! All right! The kings of France and Spain funded the smuggling of weapons and equipment to the Americans. Although wary of publicly encouraging the overthrow of a fellow monarch, they wanted the British to be beaten. Who needs a bayonet for their musket? The American army had a new momentum. The following year, 1777, 
the British campaign shifted away from the populated areas around New Jersey, northwards to Canada. I'm traveling along the mighty Hudson River, which flows all the way from Lake Champlain to New York City. It's one of the best trodden war paths in the whole of North America. The British hoped that if they could control this waterway, they could cut off the rebellious states of New England, like Massachusetts and Connecticut. They already had Canada. They already had New York City. Now they wanted to join the dots in between. The British would thrust down from Canada into the wilderness country of Upper New York State, a wild land of remote towns and American Indian communities. The leader of this campaign was General John Burgoyne. As well as a soldier, Burgoyne was a successful playwright and gambler. He'd wagered 50 guineas at his London club that he'd return victorious from America within a year. There's always a little bit of the actor, always a little bit of the mountebank in Johnny Burgoyne. There's always a bit of a bluff and a bit of a flourish. And he's never quite going to be able to put this complicated campaign together. Burgoyne was given powers to act independently of his superior in New York, William Howe, much to the latter's annoyance. The rivalry between commanders proved to be a British weakness. There's one key difference over the command structure during this war. Washington is in command throughout. Now, as well as being a good military strategist, he's quite a political animal as well. But it does mean that from the American point of view, there is one directing brain which is able to see the whole campaign through. That's not the case with the British. There's never a single British directing brain start to finish. Burgoyne wanted Howe to push up from New York as far as Albany, while he pushed down from Canada through Indian Territory. With the war on their doorstep, many tribes who would rather have stayed out of a British civil war were forced to take sides. Professor Colin Calloway believes that the revolution was a disaster for American Indians. Almost every Indian community, I think, is split by the Civil War. The Cherokees um, divide over it, the Iroquois Confederacy splits over it. You have divisions within Indian villages about which side to support. And the issues that make them divide? The issues are, I think, survival. They're all looking for what's the best route to take in this very difficult situation. Where do our allegiances lie and where do our best interests lie? And what are our chances of coming out of this with our way of life intact? 500 American Indians joined Burgoyne as scouts for his army. He exploited their fearsome reputation by publishing a proclamation threatening to unleash them on disloyal citizens. In Fort Ticonderoga, Burgoyne's arrogance disgusted American doctor James Thatcher. From the pompous manner in which he has arrayed his titles, we are led to suppose that he considers them as more than a match for all the military strength which we might bring against him by John Burgoyne, Esquire, Lieutenant General of His Majesty's Forces in America, Colonel of the Queen's Regiment of Light Dragoons, Governor of Fort William, etc., etc., etc. The British Ministry, not satisfied with the disgraceful expedient of hiring foreign mercenaries, resort also to the savages of the wilderness. Here was the image of the British government unleashing these terrible warriors on people who, after all, were British subjects. And that was something that needed some explaining. Um, now, of course, the whole notion of what constituted savage and civilized warfare was pretty muddy. Uh, and many Indian people regarded uh, the, the, the Europeans, whether they be French, British, or Americans, as, as the perpetrators of uncivilized warfare, because they fought by such different rules. By June, Burgoyne's Indian scouts were approaching Fort Ticonderoga. It appeared to be a formidable American stronghold defending the narrowest part of Lake Champlain. Twenty-three-year-old Dr. Thatcher, who was billeted there, 
was confident Burgoyne's army would not get past the fort. The utmost exertions are now being made to strengthen our works at Ticonderoga. Mount Independence, directly across from Ticonderoga, is strongly fortified and well supplied with artillery. The communication between these two places is maintained by a floating bridge. It is supposed to be admirably adapted to the double purpose of a communication, as well as an impenetrable barrier to any vessel who might attempt to pass our works. The Americans held both sides of the lake, but they hadn't bothered to fortify that height, called Mount Defiance, considering that it was too steep for artillery. Burgoyne's senior artillery officer was Major General William Phillips, described as honest, industrious, and irascible. He told Burgoyne that where a goat can go, a man can go, and where a man can go, he can drag a gun. It took the British two days to get two 12-pounder cannon up there. It is with astonishment that we find the enemy have taken over Mount Defiance, which from its height and proximity, completely overlook and command all our works at Ticonderoga. The situation of our garrison is viewed as critical and alarming. The whole garrison fled. The British ships smashed through the floating bridge and Ticonderoga was taken with hardly a shot being fired. The abandonment of Ticonderoga has occasioned the greatest surprise and alarm. No event could be more severely felt throughout our country and our army, nor more unexpected. This disaster has given to our cause a dark and gloomy aspect. But while it was a severe blow to American morale, the loss of Ticonderoga actually worked in their favor. Burgoyne's close pursuit lured him away from the waterways where he was mobile into the virgin forests of New York State. He attempted a 25-mile shortcut to reach the Hudson, but it was to take him a month. He was hampered by a huge retinue of camp followers, 500 women and children, and officers' wives in coaches. Right up to the Crimean War, which is almost a century ahead, the Redcoat goes on campaign with Mrs. Redcoat, often not Mrs. in any literal legal sense. But Burgoyne's army comes here with its wives and followers and mistresses and hangers on. Thomas Anbury, a lieutenant in Burgoyne's army, recorded their terrible journey. The watery lands and marshes were so numerous, we had to construct no less than 40 bridges by which to pass them. And over one morass, there was a bridge two miles in length. The British not only had to contend with nature, but also with sabotage from an enemy familiar with its environment. I think the real parallels between the American War of Independence and Vietnam, I was in America during the Vietnam War, and it, it, it always strikes me that, that any army operating a long way from home in country which it really doesn't know is always at a disadvantage. It has to bring its supplies from another continent. It, it's never really in control of even its own supporters. It controls them in the daytime, it controls them as far as its own artillery reaches. But it's always at the mercy of a tougher, harder, better organized opposition which gets at its supporters when it can't defend them. The deeper Burgoyne pressed on, the more extreme his difficulties became. His supply line from Canada was stretched to the limit. He had to leave men behind to protect it reducing his army to less than 5,000 men. Burgoyne also found that he couldn't control his Indian allies. They insisted on their right to scalp victims, even though it harmed the British cause. They seized the head of the disabled or dead enemy, and placing one of their feet on its neck, twist their left hand in the hair, by which means they extend the skin which covers the top of the head. 
and with the other hand draw their scalping knife. If the hair is short and they have no purchase with their knife, they stoop and strip it off with their teeth. There was a wave of public revulsion when the Indians killed and scalped a young American woman who was supposed to be under their protection. Jane McRae was loyal to the British and engaged to one of Burgoyne's own officers. Her death was a propaganda coup for the Americans. On the way back to Burgoyne's camp, a quarrel arose to determine who should hold possession of the fair prize. During the controversy, one of the monsters struck his tomahawk into her skull. And immediately stripped her of her scalp. The death of Jane McRae fueled a long-running saga. At the time, patriots declaimed angrily about Britain's savage allies. And subsequent commentators maintained that it triggered a flood of recruiting. Actually, Congress was already doing its level best to raise men to stop Burgoyne. And I doubt if this tragedy had any real impact. But it certainly had an impact in the years that followed. And Jane McRae was depicted as a martyr to a cause to which she'd never personally subscribed. This defining image of Indian savagery during the revolution was painted in 1804, after America had won its independence. After turning its back on the British Empire, America was looking westwards to build an empire of its own, on Indian land. Anti-Indian sentiment helped justify this action. And that painting and that story typified or epitomized for many people what Indians did during the revolution. They, they committed mayhem, they, they murdered innocent women and children. They fought against the new nation at the moment of its birth, at the moment of liberty. Having done that, they could not complain, therefore, when the new nation, having established itself, said, there's no place for you here. By late summer, Burgoyne's army had reached the Hudson. The river runs along the edge of that woodland. Borgoyne crossed it onto this side and destroyed his boat bridge behind him, cutting his umbilical cord with Canada. His men were now on half rations, with supplies enough for just a month. Success was now dependent on reinforcement and supplies from the south, but contact was proving difficult. The Second World War American commander, Omar Bradley, said that Congress makes a man a general but communications makes him a commander. That was the essence of the British problem in 1777. Late in the day, Burgoyne received a message telling him that Howe had moved south to Pennsylvania, leaving General Henry Clinton in New York. Burgoyne was counting on relief from Clinton, despite the uncertainty of messages getting through. Howe in Philadelphia, Clinton in New York State, and Burgoyne up here all had their plans and their ambitions. If Burgoyne had retreated when he had the chance, his intact army could still have posed a threat to American strategy. But there are times when there's nothing so stupid as a gallant officer. Burgoyne could not conceive of retreat, even if pressing on sacrificed his long-suffering soldiers. At Saratoga, he ordered them up onto the heights to attack a newly formed northern army under the command of General Horatio Gates. The British faced 9,000 Americans, double their own force. The Redcoats had learned to fear the American riflemen, the country's legendary marksmen, who used the range and accuracy of their rifles to snipe at the enemy from deep cover.
the rifleman had a distinctive private signal to communicate. Saratoga, Colonel Daniel Morgan's Rifle Corps intercepted the British, picking off their officers to throw the troops into confusion. The riflemen claimed 600 victims that day. Riflemen were also among the most vulnerable troops in the field. While an infantryman armed with a musket could reload three or four times a minute and fix a bayonet for hand to hand fighting, a rifle took a full minute to reload and it had no bayonet. If rushed after firing, the rifleman was defenseless. Saratoga was the first battle in which the Americans adopted the European tactic of using infantrymen to protect riflemen. Burgoyne was surprised by the tenacity and discipline of the American army. The action went backwards and forwards all day like waves on a sea. The Americans were content to leave the battlefield to the British that night. Gates knew that without urgent supplies, Burgoyne's army was crippled. All he had to do was wait. After three weeks, and no sign of Clinton, Burgoyne made a final fruitless attack. He was forced to surrender or starve. Burgoyne negotiated a gentlemanly surrender with Gates that allowed him to take his army home terms that were later broken. They toasted George Washington and they toasted King George. Yet Burgoyne was oblivious to the serious impact his defeat would have on the war. Saratoga did more than remove a small piece from the military chessboard. It sent out a clear political message. Here in America, where the loyalists were disheartened and the patriots elated, and back in Britain, where the war's opponents said they'd seen this coming all along. Most of all, Saratoga delighted the French, a waning superpower humiliated by British victory in the Seven Years' War, and persuaded them to enter the conflict. It had always been a civil war. Now it was a world war as well. If the American War of Independence had been fought at sea, it would have been no contest. The Americans actually had an admiralty, but almost no ships for it to administer. The British, in contrast, had a huge navy, and at least in the war's early years, took their ability to rule the waves for granted. The new British commander-in-chief, General Sir Henry Clinton, devised a bold strategy an invasion of the South by sea, intended to penetrate into what were believed to be Britain's loyalist heartlands. But in the loyalist heartland of the American South, the actual British forces were few in number, and Britain wanted to build up the loyalist ranks by tapping into the large black slave population. The British governor of Virginia, the Earl of Dunmore, himself a slave owner, issued a startling proclamation. And I do hereby further declare all indented servants, Negroes or others appertaining to rebels free that are able and willing to bear arms, they joining His Majesty's troops as soon as may be. The vision of black armies aligned against him alarmed George Washington, 
the commander of the American Continental Army and a slave owner. In a letter to a friend, he expressed indignation over Don Moore's plan. If, my dear sir, that man is not crushed before spring, he will become the most formidable enemy America has. His strength will increase as a snowball by rolling. And faster. If some expedient cannot be hit upon to convince the slaves and servants of the impotency of his designs, nothing less than depriving him of life or liberty will secure peace to Virginia. The father of American liberty was only for freedom if it didn't apply to his black brethren or his slaves. Dunmore had stirred the anger of the normally cool Washington. Dunmore's proclamation had immediate consequences. On an island at the mouth of the Savannah River, there was a community of 200 runaway slaves. Now Georgia's white rebels saw them as potential agents of the British and issued an order to seize, and if nothing else will do, to destroy all those rebellious Negroes upon Tybee Island, or wherever they may be found. On March the 25th, 1776, a group of rebels disguised as Indians, together with some genuine Indian allies, landed on the island. What happened foreshadowed the wider conflict to come, a war without mercy. The black runaway community on Tybee Island was crushed. Two years later, in the winter of 1778, when a British expeditionary force moved down the South Carolina coast towards the mouth of the Savannah River, it passed Tybee Island. There would be no welcome here. The British ships positioned themselves for what appeared to be a frontal attack on the city of Savannah, a critical rebel stronghold. But it was only a diversion. The real attack came from the rear along paths through swamps like this on the outskirts of Savannah. A local slave showed the invaders the way, and it was a brilliantly successful maneuver. Savannah fell to the British, and it was a slave who made it possible. Many slaves, mistreated by their rebel owners, had everything to gain from a British victory. One. David George wrote an account of his life. He saw the British as his salvation, his way out of slavery. I have been whipped many a time on my naked skin, and sometimes till the blood has run down over my waistband. George learned to read and write from white children and became a lay preacher at open air services at Silver Bluff. There will be days where we will not be beaten for having a voice. My people, there are better days ahead. And as the good Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by the reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up and out. I continued preaching at Silver Bluff till the church, constituted with eight, increased to 30 or more and till the British came to the city of Savannah. David George preached to one of the first black Baptist churches in America. Today, the Silver Bluff congregation is still as active as ever. In the south of the 1770s, Many black Americans embraced the Earl of Dunmore's promise of freedom to those who came over to the British side. Some even signed up to fight in Dunmore's so-called Ethiopian Regiment. Others fought on the side of the rebels. They wanted to believe in the rhetoric of all men are created equal, 
enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. They wanted to turn those words into reality. Dr. Frank Robertson has written a book about David George and the divided loyalties in the African-American community during the Revolutionary War. Frank, what effect do you think the appearance of a British fleet here in 1778 actually had on local African-Americans? Well, it, it caused some celebration and, and some hope, uh, basically, for those who had been enslaved uh, in America uh, during the colonial period for quite a while. An unfair question, this I know, but what do you think you might have made of it at the time? Uh, I probably would have challenged uh, what was being said and what was being espoused in, in this great declaration of independence, and, and why would not those same things be extended uh, to me uh, as, uh, as an African-American? Do you think David George's attitude to the war was shared by other African Americans? Well, David George, if his action was any indication as to what most individuals felt about the war during that particular time, it was probably a welcome uh, event uh, as he saw it as an opportunity uh, for freedom. Once the British force had secured Savannah, it moved north, took Augusta, and on March the 3rd, 1779, defeated an American force sent down from South Carolina at Briar Creek. The comparatively small British army then headed for Charleston, but the threat of a larger American force sent it scuttling back to Savannah. Suddenly the British, trapped over there in the town, began to look very vulnerable. After the American victory at Saratoga in the north, the French had seized the opportunity to humiliate the British and entered the war. Now a huge French fleet, 22 ships of the line and 10 frigates, commanded by Admiral Condestin, sailed right into the Savannah River. Some of its ships anchored just beyond that bend and began to bombard the town. Other cannon were sent ashore and opened fire from just beyond where those buildings now stand. This is just one of the thousands of cannonballs that pounded the British and Loyalist defences day after day. During the siege of Savannah, the French hammered the British from land and sea. But the French Admiral feared that the Royal Navy would come to the city's rescue. So he chose to attack over land, through Savannah's notorious swamps. David George found himself caught up in the fighting. A ball came through the stable where we lived and much shattered it. George's main concern was now protecting his family. It was becoming clear that the French were preparing for a major assault. This made us remove to Yamakra, where we sheltered ourselves under the floor of a house on the ground. For the French and their American allies, the attack was a disaster. The swamplands which the British had successfully crossed a year earlier when they took Savannah now became a deadly trap for the French and Americans. They were mown down. Fifty-seven British soldiers were killed or wounded in the battle. The French lost ten times as many, and even their commander was hit. The Americans lost 231 men. One of them, Sergeant William Jasper, was said to have clutched the American flag as he fell dying. This was the first real battle between British and French regulars since France had joined the war. One of the bloodiest battles of the American Revolution had secured British control of Georgia. Following the battle, the French reduced their involvement in the war. But the British victory gave hope to thousands of escaping slaves who sought protection and support from the victors. 
the territory controlled by the British became, for a time, a promised land. Some 5,000 African Americans came over to the British during the Georgia campaign, approximately one third of the local black population. In the South, at least, African Americans were overwhelmingly on the side of Britain and the Loyalists. In the North, the picture was less clear. Some African Americans fought for the rebels, but only after securing a promise that doing so would end their slavery. Washington had initially opposed the recruitment of black soldiers, but, desperate for volunteers, changed his mind. As the general is informed that numbers of free Negroes are desirous of enlisting, he gives leave to recruiting officers to entertain them and promises to lay the matter before Congress, who he doubts not will approve of it. Washington and his army had endured two grim winters in the north, one at Valley Forge, and now another at Morristown, New Jersey. I assure you, every idea you can form of our distresses will fall short of the reality. There is such a combination of circumstances to exhaust the patience of the soldiery that it begins at length to be worn out. And we can see in every line of the army the most serious features of the mutiny. <laughs> In addition to recruiting black soldiers, Washington had now acquired two key foreign allies. The young Marquis de Lafayette became the liaison officer to the French forces. He lobbied hard for continuing French support, despite the setback at Savannah, and in 1780 won 5,000 more French troops for Washington. Another key recruit was the self-styled Lieutenant General Baron von Steuben. He was a former Prussian captain, a mercenary who'd failed to find a job with anyone else. Yet he turned out to be a superb instructor of the infantry in the military arts. He eventually helped forge the American soldiers into a powerful army. The Americans at this stage in the war really aren't formidable soldiers in the European sense of the word. But this is a war which is going to be won by the people that keep fighting the longest. And there is, I think, that enormous quality of depth to the American performance, even if sometimes they're not as good on the battlefield as the British. They do have the ability to play a long game, and that's what ultimately the British can't do. Encouraged by the success of the small naval expedition to Savannah, a larger British force now headed south. Georgia had been secured, but South Carolina remained in rebel hands. On New Year's Day, 1780, a huge British force was moving down the coast from New York towards Charleston in appalling weather. General Sir Henry Clinton, the commander-in-chief, was launching the first major British offensive since Saratoga. Even before the British fleet had reached Charleston, Clinton had appealed to the slave population offering freedom in exchange for loyalty, much as Dunmore had five years earlier. Every Negro who shall desert the rebel standard shall enjoy the full security to follow within these lines any occupation which he shall think proper. To the so-called rice kings of Charleston, the slave owners who had built their fortunes on the twin foundations of rice and slave labor, the British offer was an outrage. It threatened to undermine the booming economy, not only of Charleston, but of South Carolina and all the southern states. And that was precisely the British intention. Some 20,000 South Carolina slaves went over to the British. When the Rice Kings, the rich rebels here in Charleston, talked about liberty, they made it absolutely clear that this didn't extend to that half of South Carolina's population, which was black. And the rebels weren't only apprehensive about escaping slaves. 
the British fleet of warships and transports carrying troops was getting closer. The fleet sailed past Charleston and landed a scouting party at North Edisto Inlet. From there, the scouts hacked their way inland to Drayton Hall, undeterred by mosquitoes, alligators and the suffocating heat. The ships then returned to Charleston Harbour and, under cover of darkness, unloaded the rest of their soldiers into flatboats. Early on the morning of the 29th of March, 1780, 22 flatboats with muffled oars slipped up the Ashley River from Charleston Harbour. The rebels guarding it heard nothing at all. They were met here at Drayton's landing place by the cream of the British Army. Under the very noses of the rebels, they crossed the river without any opposition whatsoever. They were now in a position to besiege the city of Charleston. If they could control the bridge over which much of the city's supplies flowed. The man charged with that task was a British officer named Banasta Tarleton. Bloody ban to his foes. He commanded the pro-British loyalists in the south and became celebrated for his bravery and notorious for his brutality. There used to be a bridge just here and Tarleton took it with that wild dash that soon became his trademark. British and loyalist victory here at Monk's Corner was crucial. Tarleton's force advanced along a road surrounded by swamps. When it reached the bridge held by the rebels, Tarleton attacked them head on. The British would soon control all the approaches to Charleston and besiege the city. After a month of full siege, with heavy bombardments, Charleston fell to become a British bastion. During the siege, 76 British and Loyalist soldiers had been killed. The rebels' losses were broadly similar, but more importantly, 3,600 of their regulars were taken prisoner when the city surrendered. In addition, 1,800 captured militiamen were sent home on parole, and huge quantities of American arms fell into the hands of the victors. A 25-year-old Loyalist officer, Lieutenant Anthony Allaire, rode into the city following the triumphant British Army. He was seeing Charleston, then the richest city in America, for the first time. Spent the day in viewing Charleston and found it not a little like New York. Displayed the British standard on the ramparts, saw the poor rebel dogs very much chagrined at not being allowed to wear sidearms. The capture of Charleston was arguably the greatest British triumph of the war so far and seemed likely to ensure control of the South. But the Loyalists weren't winning the Hearts and Minds campaign. Eliza Wilkinson, from a wealthy South Carolina family, increasingly sympathized with the rebels. In letters to a friend, she expressed her distress at the British triumph. Much as I had admired the former luster of the British character, my soul shrank from the thought of having any communication with the people who had left their homes with a direct intention to imbrue their hands in the blood of my beloved countrymen or deprive them of their birthright, liberty, and property. Deciding which side to take in what is, after all, a civil war was never easy. And I often think that we tend, as historians, to lend far more form to it than was really the case. I think people made decisions on the basis of family loyalty, loyalty to their friends, sheer luck often. If you're in an area occupied by the British, then being a loyalist made sense. And I think there are very few people who are absolutely politically committed one way or the other. 
and an awful lot who are going to join the winning side. As the British Army moved northwards from Charleston, its commanders began to pick up substantial loyalist support, mainly from the poor whites, the upcountry men. But the British were already beginning to have two serious problems. Before he handed over command here in the south to Lord Cornwallis, Clinton insisted that paroled American prisoners must be prepared to fight on his side. And the behavior of some British and loyalist troops was beginning to alienate local opinion. Eliza Wilkinson, already a rebel sympathizer, wrote of her shock at the way the British troops behaved in her home. They were up to the house, entered with drawn swords and pistols in their hands. Indeed, they rushed in in the most furious manner, crying out. The moment they espied us, off went our caps. And for what, thank you? Why, only to get a paltry stone and wax pin, which kept them on our heads. At the same time, uttering the most abusive language imaginable, and making as if they'd hew us to pieces with their swords. It was terrible to the last degree, and what augmented it? They had several armed Negroes with them, who threatened and abused us greatly. They then began to plunder their house of everything they thought valuable or worth taking. Rebel men were even worse treated. At the wax halls, Vanessa Tarleton caught up with a column of 350 retreating Virginians. Despite an attempt to surrender, a hundred of them were killed. Some called it a massacre. Others saw it as the inevitable result of hot blood and cold steel. Whatever the truth, Bloody Ban was earning his nickname. As I followed the route of the British advance, I wanted to find out what ordinary Americans thought about the war. I'm not able to remember a lot of the dates and the battles and the things like that, but it was all about freedom and uh, rights. And that's what we're still having trouble with in the world is freedom and rights. And I think that's why uh, all the wars come about is uh, people feel that they have been oppressed. Uh, they uh, take it as long as they can and then they fight. Now, what, but, you know, what do you think war was really about? That war was about, uh, about, about independence and separation from Great Britain to the United States because they had colonies already set up here, you know? Yeah. We declare ourselves independent. You understand? What do you think it was really about? I think basically it was a war fought by rich people who didn't want to pay taxes. I think that it was probably worth it for the larger landowners, but uh, I don't think most people had much to gain. I was talking about it just last night with a friend of mine, and we were talking about, uh, you know, the War of Independence and all the j that jazz, and, you know, for God's sake, if we hadn't won, we'd all be British and have socialized medicine and a decriminalized society. The cops wouldn't have guns. Oh, my goodness. At this stage of the war, it looked as if Britain was going to win. As the British Army advanced further into upcountry South Carolina, it expected to gather further Loyalist support. The Loyalist officer, Anthony Allaire, advancing into unknown territory, seemed to believe that the locals were coming over to the victor's side. Good evening, men. Good evening, sir. Took up our ground at five o'clock in the morning. This morning was so cold that we were glad to hover around large fires as soon as we halted. Good work today. The poor, deluded people of this province begin to be sensible of their error and come in very fast. Meet uh, Jackson and Smith. Adams is the best shot in the upstate. But the British and their loyalist allies were in for a surprise. A substantial American rebel force was moving southward. It was led by Horatio Gates, the victor of Saratoga. He was seeking a confrontation with Lord Cornwallis, the British commander, who was preparing to move north. On the 15th of August, Cornwallis decided on a night advance beginning at 10 o'clock. Tarleton's dragoons were in the lead, and by two in the morning they'd reached this spot, Saunders Creek. They were in for a nasty shock. By an extraordinary coincidence, the Americans had also decided on an advance, 
at precisely the same time. At this spot, the two advance guards literally bumped into one another. For 15 minutes, there was wild confusion. But neither side wanted to pitch battle in the dark. They separated and waited under arms for the dawn. The 2,000 British regulars at Camden knew that in the morning, they and their bayonets would have to take on the 3,000 American soldiers who were just 250 yards away from them in the darkness. The socket bayonet was dreadfully simple. It slotted onto the musket's muzzle with a quarter turn. The soldiers over here on the British right flank, the Royal West Fusiliers, the 33rd Regiment, and five companies of light infantry, were thoroughly familiar with the use of the bayonet. The rebels facing them were not. About two and a half thousand militia from North Carolina and Virginia were over there, in the area where the wood edge now stands. They'd actually been issued with bayonets, but had received no training in their use. Indeed, many of them had never been in battle before. For those amateur soldiers, the sight confronting them at dawn on the 16th of August must have been terrifying. When the raw soldiers of the Virginia militia saw the British professionals advancing with bayonets fixed and ready for use, they turned tail and fled without firing a shot. On the right flank, a section of the Continental Army, the by now well-trained American regulars, held firm. Fire! But the flight of Virginia amateurs enabled the British cavalry to strike at their vulnerable flank. It was the coup de grace. The battlefield was littered with discarded muskets, abandoned knapsacks, smashed wagons, dead horses, and dead men. 68 British and Loyalists, but 250 rebels. But where was the American commander? Scarpered. Mounted on the fastest horse in his army, Horatio Gates had exited the battlefield faster even than the Virginia militia. The American commander had proved himself a loser, completely outwitted and outmaneuvered. The victor of Saratoga had ridden himself out of the American Hall of Fame and into ignominy. Victory at Camden moved Britain one step closer to the total conquest of the South and helped to quell opposition to the war back home. Five weeks later, Washington arrived at West Point, one of the most formidable American garrisons. He was in for a shock. There was no sign of Benedict Arnold. What is it, soldier? The American general who was in command at West Point and had helped beat the British at Saratoga. Arnold, it soon emerged, had gone over to the enemy. Yeah. Who can we trust now? Although Arnold was by now behind the British lines, the rebels did catch Major John Andre, the British officer who had negotiated Arnold's defection. Washington needed a scapegoat and insisted on Andre's execution. At the present alarming crisis of our affairs, the public safety calls for a solemn and impressive example. Nothing can satisfy it short of the execution of the prisoner as a common spy. But Washington needn't have felt quite so desperate. Although the British could push on into South Carolina with comparative ease, 
the rebels were able to avoid fighting pitched battles. An army marching into country like this was vulnerable to sudden attack from an enemy armed with accurate long-range weapons. The attackers would then be able to withdraw into woodland that they knew like the backs of their hands. The rebels in the south were gradually realizing, like the Viet Cong did when fighting the Americans in Vietnam, that guerrilla warfare was a far more effective way of wearing out a powerful, well-organized army. Southern loyalists, like Anthony Allaire, now felt that the tide was in fact turning against them. This settlement is composed of the most violent rebels I ever saw. I can say with propriety that there is not a regiment or detachment of His Majesty's service that ever went through the fatigues or suffered so much as our detachment. In the first place, we were separated from all the army acting with the militia. We never lay two nights in one place frequently making forced marches of 20 and 30 miles in one night, skirmishing very often, the greatest part of our time without rum or wheat flour. Rum is a very essential article, for in marching 10 miles, we would often be obliged to ford two or three rivers, which wet the men up to their waists. In this disagreeable situation, we remained till October. Allaire was facing the deadly fire of the American rifle. This is a flintlock rifle. It's ignited in just the same way as the musket. It's more expensive, more fragile, and won't take a bayonet for hand-to-hand -hand combat. But its barrel is grooved, spinning the ball in flight and making it much more accurate. It's got a killing range of three or four hundred yards, or even further. In countryside like this, the rifle was monarch of all it surveyed. The American rifle took a long time to load, and is of course nowhere near as precise as one equipped with a modern telescopic sight. Nevertheless, the accuracy of this faithful replica of a 200-year-old rifle is remarkable. The park ranger at Cedar Creek Rifle Range, Scott Alexander, well is an amateur historian Scott, who has researched the war in this frontier area. I wanted to know if the right to bear arms was an important issue. That was one of the issues that led to the war. Uh, as far as the frontiersmen in this area were concerned, they were fighting for the right of Western expansion. As far as Mother England was concerned, uh, the war started because of the illegal encroachment by English-speaking colonists on French and Indian territory and the right to bear arms and the right to advance westward were very important issues and that's why in the United States Constitution the right to bear arms was the second right in the Bill of Rights which consists of ten separate rights it came in number two immediately after freedom of speech who do you think people saw the oppressor as being King George and the Parliament away in England or the rice kings and the local power brokers I think that that, that issue it was it was such a complicated issue that it was different from one group to another. But you could easily have been living in these parts and felt unoppressed by King George, who after all was a long way away. That's true, and then felt very oppressed by the British troops sent by him. Do you think the Americans were right to fight? Uh, unfortunately, it was one of those situations where there was no good answer. Uh, I, I think it was inevitable, though. And people would simply make their minds up with local influences and local pressures. That's true, and many times the issues in one community that led to the fighting were very different than the issues in another community 50 miles away. There were a number of battles, probably the most famous being Kings Mountain, where there was only uh, one person at the battle who was born and raised overseas. At Kings Mountain, a force of a thousand loyalists would face a slightly smaller force of rebel guerrillas. The only British-born soldier there was Major Patrick Ferguson, Bulldog Ferguson, a courageous Scottish officer. But his call to arms to the men of North Carolina 
suggested a certain lack of tact. You choose to be pissed upon by a set of mongrels, say so at once, and let your women turn their backs upon you, and look out for real men to protect them. Take action! Load! Ferguson had set up a base at Gilbert Town, North Carolina, but intended to join the rest of the British Army, now moving up from Camden to Charlotte under Cornwallis's command. Then he learnt that a rebel force was gathering in the mountains at Sycamore Shoals. He started to move towards Cornwallis's army, then stopped and made a stand. The place he chose was here, King's Mountain. And presumably he chose it on the generally sound military principle that it's best to hold the high ground. But King's Mountain, now as then, is heavily wooded, steep and rocky. In fact, ideal terrain for irregulars experienced in guerrilla and Indian fighting. And that precisely describes the over-mountain men who were heading in Ferguson's direction. These were not the rich rebels of the East Coast. Most of them were men who'd scratched a living from land in the West that they'd wrench from Native Americans. Militant Protestants, they resented authority of any kind, especially that of the British King. For all his bravado, Ferguson knew he was in for a tough battle. I should hope for success against them myself, but numbers compared, that must be doubtful. Something must be done soon. Prior to the battle, the eccentric Ferguson donned a distinctive checkered coat. The trees and rocks at King's Mountain provided ample cover against the Loyalists' volleys. Eventually, the Loyalists resorted to the battle technique that had so often been effective in the past, the bayonet charge. Anthony Allaire was in the thick of the fighting. When our detachment charged for the first time, it fell to my luck to put a rebel captain to death, which I did most effectively with one blow of my sword. The fellow was at least six feet high, but I had rather the advantage as I was mounted on an elegant horse and he on foot. The rebels were charged and drove back several times with considerable slaughter. But the rebels could cope with these loyalist charges by simply melting away into the trees and reassembling when the charge was over. The rebels had completely surrounded King's Mountain, forcing Ferguson to withdraw to this end of the ridge. That left them free to climb up there, to the end of the ridge that he'd abandoned. Ferguson had an elaborate system of whistle signals to communicate his orders. But as the rebels came closer, this began to break down, and some of the loyalists attempted to surrender. I will not yield to such an Ferguson was determined not to surrender to those he regarded with contempt. But by their third assault, the rebels had got within close range of the Loyalist's last enclave. Aware of the futility of his position, Ferguson attempted to break out. The Loyalist plight was now hopeless. They were trapped at one end of the ridge and their commander had been killed. They surrendered. Ferguson's death and the surrender did not end the bloodletting. Even after the Loyalists had submitted, the rebels knifed many of their prisoners. In all, 156 Loyalists had been killed, compared with just 28 rebels. Suddenly, the British position in the south looked extremely vulnerable. The anniversary of the rebels' victory is commemorated to this day. Those who attend see the victors as patriots, not rebels, 
And for some, the Battle of King's Mountain has strong family associations. Uh, I'm here because my great, 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 great grandfather fought here uh, this day back in 1780. Um, he was part of the Over the Mountain men who came down from Wilkes County. And his name was First Lieutenant Samuel Johnson at that time. And my name's Sam Johnson and I'm a direct descendant of him. Much like any war, you know, you have to, you have to decide which side you're your heart's behind, and, and I feel that, that that's what he had done. He had, he left his home on his wedding night to, to join his men to come here under Colonel Cleveland. Did you have any family members on the other side? Not to my knowledge. If, if so, they were probably erased from our family history at some point by the winning side. So. It certainly was a, a, a fight for freedom in, in their hearts, as in our memories. So. Um, I have a family member that died in the Battle of Kings Mountain, and I came to honor him today. Which side was he on? He was on the Patriot side. Was your family all Patriots or split? No, he was actually the only brother who was a Patriot. Everybody else remained Loyalist, and uh, so I guess the family was very divided. And what happened during the battle? Um, there were actually two brothers, Preston, my grandfather, and his brother George. They came up to fight in the battle. They saw each other at the same time, raised their muskets, fired, and killed each other right at the same moment. It's, um, there's several documents of this happening in the war and how sad it was that it was brother against brother. And Preston's wife, my grandmother, and a slave put him on a sled and drug his body about 30 to 40 miles from here and he was buried in the family burial ground. To the calm left! A brutal civil war in which neighbor murdered neighbor and brother shot brother has become an occasion for nostalgia and quaint ceremony. We commemorate these men, these patriots, this first generation of American veterans. Fix your right hand to your firelock. To the right about, three steps forward, death, mask, for independence and the courage to win it, dismiss, Huzzah! We Brits, the old enemy, now seem to have been forgiven. Even Eliza Wilkinson had an opportunity to forgive, writing proudly to her friend of the kindness her household showed to a wounded loyalist officer. We could find no rag to dress his wounds. Everything in the house being thrown into such confusion by the plunderers. But see the native tenderness of an American. Miss Samuels took from her neck the only remaining handkerchief the Britons had left her, and with it bound up his arm. Blush, O oh Britons, and be confounded. Your delight is cruelty and oppression. Divested of all humanity, you imitate savages. The Americans are obliged to commit unavoidable acts of cruelty. The defense of their country requires it. You seek their lives and liberties, and they must either kill or be killed. Yet, imitating the all-merciful Creator, in the midst of anger, they remember mercy. The victors of King's Mountain were less inclined to be merciful. After a hasty trial, 36 prisoners were sentenced to death. They were to be hanged, three at a time. Anthony Allaire was by now a prisoner of the rebels. It seemed that he too would face execution. This is a specimen of rebel lenity. You may report it without the least equivocation. For upon the word and honor of a gentleman, this description is not equal to their barbarity. Eventually, Allaire was able to escape. But nine of his fellow loyalists had in effect been lynched before the rebel commander called a halt. King's Mountain was a turning point. It sent out a clear warning to Britain and her American loyalist allies. Cornwallis and his men headed back southwards. His black allies, 
well aware of the lynch law they'd receive on the other side, went with him. No one was more terrified of a rebel victory than former slaves, who'd thrown in their lot with the British in exchange for freedom. Now that the rebels were winning, they feared the worst. David George, so happy when the British took Savannah, was now compelled to join the British as they withdrew. Along with many loyalist blacks, George and his family would eventually be forced to leave America altogether to find freedom. The great British dream of a powerful alliance with American loyalists was falling apart. And the guerrilla tactics of the rebels were wearing down the regular forces. But as the War of American Independence moved to its climax, the British Army was going to prove that it still had plenty of fight left in it. Next time on Rebels and Redcoats, the war reaches its climax. By 1781, the American War of Independence had been raging for five years. It had become a bitter struggle, in which neither side yet had the upper hand. Even though the Americans had made good use of guerrilla tactics, facing the might of the British redcoats in the field was perilous. And the Royal Navy's mastery of the sea still gave Britain a huge advantage. Yet before the end of the year, an extraordinary sequence of British mistakes on land and sea would transform America's destiny. Yorktown stands on the Virginia Peninsula, only 20 miles from Britain's first colony in North America. It's close to the colonial capital of Williamsburg, where today, aside from the tourists, things still look much as they did in the 18th century. In early 1781, Williamsburg was as divided as any American town. The Declaration of Independence had won over many Americans to the rebel cause, but others still felt allegiance to King George III. Behind one door was a loyalist, behind the next was a rebel. George Washington, leader of the American Continental Army, was in no position to end this civil war at any time soon. In January 1781, he'd been forced to suppress mutinies amongst his troops. He was at his lowest ebb. Instead of having everything in readiness to take the field, we have nothing. And instead of the prospect of a glorious offensive campaign before us, we have a bewildered and gloomy defensive one. Unless we should receive a powerful aid of ships, land troops, and money from our generous allies. But these at present are too contingent to build upon. In the north, Washington's war-weary army was still stuck at the fort of West Point on the Hudson River. Across the river, the British redcoats were comfortably barracked in loyalist New York. But it was to be in the south, hundreds of miles away from the rival army's headquarters, where the deadlock would be broken. There were more than 10,000 British soldiers in the south, but most of them were tied up in garrisons like Charleston and Savannah. The British knew that if they were to win the war, they had to get out from behind their barricades. Doing nothing was simply not an option. Lord Cornwallis, the new British commander in the south, was convinced that just one outright victory would crush the revolution. 
He would use his 4,000 strong field army to destroy the rebels in the south, releasing troops and resources for a final assault on Washington in the north. He'd been assured that thousands of southern loyalists were waiting to swell his ranks. As he set out on the offensive into the depths of South Carolina, he had one huge advantage. Although both field armies were pretty reasonably matched, with around 4,000 men apiece, Cornwallis knew that his redcoats were the better troops. They were highly trained, well disciplined, and didn't have to worry about bringing in the harvest or feeding their families. Cornwallis's opponent, commander of the American Southern Army, was a 38-year-old former Quaker, Nathaniel Greene. He was painfully aware of the deficiencies of his irregular militias. You may strike a hundred blows and reap little benefit from them unless you have a strong army to take advantage of your success. The enemy will never relinquish their plan, nor the people be firm in our favor until they behold a better barrier in the field than a volunteer militia who are out one day and home the next. This ragbag militia force was to be put to the test sooner than he had anticipated. Green decided to split his army. If he could lure Cornwallis into attacking one half of his divided force, then the other would be free to strike at the overextended British lines of supply. It was an incredible gamble against all the rules of war and with a potentially fatal flaw. If Cornwallis picked off each of the weakened American armies in turn, then the war in the South would be over. Cornwallis dispatched a force to seek out and destroy the smaller of the two American armies under General Daniel Morgan. The British force was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Bernasta Tarleton, nicknamed Bloody Bam and the Butcher, for his alleged massacre of American prisoners of war. 26-year-old Tarleton, part dashing cavalryman, part 18th century Colonel Kurtz, had a reputation for ruthlessness that matched his American guerrilla rivals. He's supposed to have said, I've killed more men and slept with more women than any man in America. On the morning of the 17th of January, Tarleton's wolf pack of around 1,100 men closed in for the kill on grazing land at Cowpens, South Carolina. In theory, Tarleton should just have had the edge. About half his men were British regulars, redcoat infantry, and a few cavalry. The rest were American loyalists of his British legion, horse and foot. Morgan's army looked strangely similar, with some hard-bitten regular infantry, and lots of militia and guerrilla bands. The armies were now coming to resemble one another, with elements of both regular and irregular warfare. But the tactics the Americans were about to use would transform the war in the South. The American general, Daniel Morgan, was a charismatic, hard-drinking, hard-fighting frontiersman who had good reason to hate the British. He'd once received 500 lashes while serving as a wagoner with the British Army. Morgan's real problem was that only 400 of his men were regulars. Most of the rest were militia, liable to panic and run away at a crucial moment, as they had so often in the past. So the night before the battle, he went round his camp like Henry V before Agincourt, encouraging his men, explaining his tactics, telling them that they wouldn't be left to the bayonets of the British infantry or the sabres of Tarleton's feared cavalry. At five in the morning, he rallied them again. Boys, get up. Benny is coming. Morgan's tactics that morning 
were indeed revolutionary. Instead of forming his men up in tightly packed ranks, he drew them up in three widely spaced defensive lines. This wasn't simply defense in depth, designed to physically and psychologically exhaust the British. It maximized the capabilities of his militia, many of them good shots, but reluctant to take the regulars on in close combat. He would effectively ambush the British. When the impulsive Tarleton saw the first American line, he immediately ordered an attack without consulting other commanders in the field and regardless of the fact that his men had been on the march for most of the night. The first line of widely spread sharpshooters was hidden here in the grass. They had orders to fire once and then fall back. Their first shots picked off 15 dragoons and checked the first cavalry charge. The second line, more experienced militia, was about 150 yards behind. They'd been told to fire just two volleys when the British were in killing range, concentrating on the epaulet men, the officers. Then they too could disperse. As the battle-hardened British bayonet men crashed into the American third line, Morgan's bold plan was in the balance. An order to regroup was misinterpreted as a call to retreat. American regular soldiers and the remaining militias appeared to panic. The battle looked lost. Morgan himself stepped in to steady their nerves and save the day. Form, form, my brave fellows, he shouted. Give them just one more fire and the day is ours. Old Morgan is never beaten. Although the Americans had once found it hard to stop a Redcoat regiment in full flood, this time their line held. The exhausted British were effectively surrounded. Tarleton was one of the lucky few to escape. Cowpens had witnessed the most skillful display of American generalship in the Revolutionary War. Combining the strengths of his militia and regular troops, Morgan had found a way of matching the British in open battle. I think that Calpins is one of the most important American victories of the war. Although in a sense it was only a skirmish, the loss of 900 men was enough to tilt the balance of the war in the south because the armies involved were so small. Cornwallis had lost a quarter of his fighting force. But Cornwallis wasn't giving up. He, in turn, adopted a new tactic, effectively turning all his soldiers into fast-moving light infantry, abandoning supplies, and to his men's disgust, even throwing away their rum in order to move more quickly. His trusted regulars, already ravaged by disease, and reduced to a meagre ration of unripened turnips and corn, were about to be further punished by another long march through the dense forests and swamps of the southern interior. I thought I knew America reasonably well before I started filming this series, but one of the things that the filming process has emphasized is the sheer scale of America four-hour journeys by car, separating battlefields. Easy for me, but for the people at the time, that was an endless trudge. This is a land that exhausts individual soldiers and wears down armies.
Cornwallis's new model army of light troops again chased Morgan, trying to avenge the British defeat. But others were racing to catch Morgan too. Green hoped to reinforce him before the British could strike. This was a gripping game of cat and mouse. Cornwallis would be skirmishing with the American rearguard, only to discover that the American main body was just ahead of him, but over one of the many swollen rivers that cross this part of the south. As Cornwallis swept into North Carolina, he still believed that thousands of loyalists, whose support he desperately needed, would flock to his cause. The rebels were bent on deterring these loyalists. Light Horse Harry Lee, a ruthless American cavalry commander, was to use particularly ferocious methods. In the Hollywood version of history, it's bloody Ban Talton who's been demonized. But the rebels were every bit as adept at using terror tactics when it suited them. In February, Light Horse Harry Lee was sent off with a force to discourage 400 loyalists who were heading to join Cornwallis. Audaciously posing as Tarleton, he actually rode alongside the loyalist column for a bit. Then the rebels turned on the loyalists and the slaughter began. Although the loyalists begged for mercy, over 90 of them were cut down, and six prisoners were hacked to death as an example. The massacre had the desired effect of ending Cornwallis's hope of loyalist support in the South. Our experience has shown us that their numbers are not so great as had been represented, and their friendship was only passive. For we have received but little assistance from them since we came into the province. Not above 200 have been prevailed upon to follow us, either as provincials or militia. Without loyalist support, the need to crush the American southern army in the field became even more acute. In late February 1781, the two American armies under Morgan and Green met again at Guilford Courthouse, North Carolina, near what is now called Greensboro. The stage was set for what might prove to be the decisive battle in the south. The odds were stacked heavily against Cornwallis. He had 1,900 men, to his opponents more than 4,000. His men were tired and hungry. But Cornwallis wasn't in the least deterred. Green replicated the new American tactic of a three-line defense that had won Cowpens. He hoped that Cornwallis would fall into the same trap. Green was forced to set his three lines further apart because of the terrain. Each line was unable to see the other. It was a high-risk plan. The British had already marched 10 miles that day and were very tired. But when Cornwallis ordered the advance, there was no hesitation. Forward they went, with empty bellies and dirty shirts, 3,000 miles from home, to take the bayonet to the king's enemies. The first American line was about here, looking out across open fields. At 40 yards from the Americans, the British line, under Colonel Webster of the 23rd Foot, came to an abrupt halt. The Americans also held their fire. Steady. In the British vanguard was Sergeant Roger Lamb, their whole force had their arms presented and resting on a rail fence. They were taking aim with nice precision. At this awful period, a general pause took place. Both parties surveyed each other for a moment with the most awful suspense. Colonel Webster then rode forward and said, Come on, my brave fusiliers! these words operating like an inspiring voice. Dreadful was the havoc on both sides. There was a sharp, close-range firefight, which fell perhaps half 
the front rank redcoats. The American first line then withdrew, and the British marched on to the second line, harassed by snipers from both left and right flanks. Unable to see the battle unfolding in front of them, all Green and his third line of Continentals could do was to listen and wait. The British pushed on to the American second line here, which was heavily wooded 220 years ago. Advance in formed line was now impossible, and the battle broke down into pockets of action. By this stage in the war, woods like this were no deterrent to British regulars and their German comrades in arms. And after bitter, bitter fighting, they were through Green's second line, and through the woods too. Webster decided to come on, even though his men were exhausted. First, a Continental volley checked them. Then the Americans moved forward with their bayonets, bringing the British advance to a halt. Meanwhile, Cornwallis had had his horse shot from beneath him. He mounted another, only to have it veer off towards the American lines in the confusion. He was steered to safety by Sergeant Roger Lamb of the 23rd. In the center, the British foot guards pressed on and became entangled with Green's Continentals, exchanging volleys with muskets almost touching. This was the climax of the battle. It looked as if the guards would be overwhelmed and the British would lose. Then Cornwallis had a moment of ruthless inspiration. He ordered two cannon to fire grape shot at the Americans. As both sides were locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the grape shot would be indiscriminate and some British would also be hit. An artillery officer begged him to reconsider his decision. No, sir! No, sir! My orders will be obeyed! Fire! Fire! The Americans, stunned and demoralized, retreated from the field. Against all the odds, Cornwallis had snatched victory from the very jaws of defeat, and in doing so, had staved off disaster for the British cause in North America. Without a British army in the field, Green would have overrun the South, leaving the way clear for an assault on the remaining British garrisons. But like Bunker Hill at the beginning of the war, this was a Pyrrhic victory, a defeat in everything but name. For Cornwallis had lost 500 of his 1900 fighting men. He'd bought this ground at a price he simply couldn't afford to pay. In Britain, there were growing doubts about the conduct of the war. Costly battles like Guildford Courthouse were reinforcing the view that the war was unwinnable, particularly amongst the Whig opposition to the government. Charles James Fox, leader of the opposition in Parliament, declared, one more victory like this will cost us the whole war. The majority of Britons represented in Parliament had supported the war when it started, five years before. But now, that support was steadily waning. The same voters were paying for thousands of troops in North America, and the cost was too great. And there was always a feeling, especially amongst the Whigs, that the rebels were actually fighting for the traditional rights and liberties of Englishmen. The British had no clear strategy as to how to finish the war, apart from more of the same. Preoccupied with worldwide concerns, they were bereft of new ideas. And significantly, the British didn't understand the American strategy 
personified by Nathaniel Green. We fight, we get beat, rise and fight again. We never have to win a battle to win the war. The side that ultimately gets support of the people will prevail. One of the greatest American generals, Green never won a battle, but he kept his army in the field. Again, the Vietnam analogy is a very strong one. The British are good at winning battles, but can't ultimately win the war. And at the very end of the Vietnam War, a North Vietnamese colonel was talking to an American colonel. And the American colonel said, you never beat us in a single battle. And the Vietnamese said, well, I fail to understand the relevance of that. Um, we may not have beaten you in battles, but actually we've won the war, because the war wasn't about individual battles. It was about something longer and broader and deeper. The British position was further undermined when the Commander-in-Chief in New York, General Sir Henry Clinton, ordered Cornwallis to retreat to the garrison town of Charleston in South Carolina. Cornwallis refused. It was a fundamental split between the two very different generals, the Cavalier Cornwallis and the more cautious Clinton. Clinton believed that the war wouldn't now be won by offensive action. He thought that the Americans would eventually get tired of fighting and sue for peace on terms that suited the British. Cornwallis couldn't disguise his frustration with Clinton's defensive attitude. I can assure you I am quite tired of marching about the countryside in quest of adventure. If we mean an offensive war in America, then we must abandon New York and bring the bulk of our forces into Virginia. We should then have a stake to fight for, and a successful battle may give us America. If, however, we plan defensively, then let us abandon the Carolinas and fall back to New York and our salt pork, sending out the occasional raiding party to burn tobacco, etc. Left, right, left, left, left. Cornwallis left, now made a momentous right, decision left. to strike at the left. richest of all the colonies left. and the supply base for the left. American army, Virginia. He chose Yorktown on the Virginia Peninsula as his headquarters. It was a logical choice. Here, he could be reinforced and resupplied from the sea. I'm just driving onto the Virginia Peninsula. It's really one of those telling bits of military landscape, important in this war and indeed in the Civil War. For Cornwallis, it would have been a safe bet if the Royal Navy had retained command of the sea. At least Cornwallis had a clear plan. But for Washington, his Continental Army, and his French allies, the war still looked unwinnable. Things in the South were bad, but at least their forces there were causing some damage to Cornwallis. In the North, matters seemed no better. Washington and the Continental Army were stuck at West Point. The Comte de Rochambeau and a French force of 4,000 regulars had been inactive at Newport, Rhode Island for over a year. Something was urgently needed to break the deadlock, and Washington knew exactly what was required. Without a decisive naval force, we can do nothing definitive, and with it, everything honorable and glorious. A constant naval superiority will terminate the war speedily. Then in July, came the news he was so desperate for. The French Navy, at last, was about to intervene. The French Admiral de Grasse was moving north from the West Indies, with a mighty fleet heading for Chesapeake Bay. It would prove to be the turning point of the war. Washington acted decisively the minute he heard that the French fleet was on the move. He feigned an attack on New York, then rushed 400 miles further south by land and river to block Cornwallis in Yorktown, 
while de Grasse's fleet moved to control Yorktown from the sea. Meanwhile, the British sent one of their best admirals, Samuel Hood, to pursue de Grasse, assuming he was heading to New York. Washington's tactic of a feigned attack had convinced the British that New York was the intended target. Admiral Hood, with a fleet of 14 ships, pursued de Grasse from the West Indies and unknowingly overtook him. British ships with their copper bottoms sailed faster than French ones. When the British Admiral dropped anchor in New York, he met his superior officer and rival, the more cautious Admiral Graves. With no sight of the French, Hood and Graves realized that they had made a terrible mistake. The Franco-American attack was not to be on New York. De Grasse's fleet must still be planning to control the Chesapeake to ensnare Cornwallis in Yorktown. Both the British admirals now swung south themselves. But when they arrived at the Chesapeake, they found that de Grasse had beaten them to it. The normally restrained Washington, when he heard the news, jumped in the air and waved his arms with sheer delight. With Cornwallis now cut off at Yorktown, the British fleet, with 19 vessels under graves, prepared to do battle with de Grasse's 24 ships to take back Chesapeake Bay. The two-hour battle that followed might so easily have been a British victory, but there was a depressing mixture of misunderstood signals, bickering admirals, and wasted opportunities. These blunders kept the British from manoeuvring into battle line, and only the vanguards engaged. The vanguards fought mightily. But most of the ships could only observe the firefight from their positions in the rear. It never became a fully pitched battle. At the end of the day, the British fell back to assess their damage and ponder their next move. The French returned to the protection of the bay where today a mothballed fleet of American warships stands guard over the Chesapeake. Here I met with Virginia historian John Corstein. Unfortunately, when Graves comes down and engages the French fleet, Hood is in the rear of the English line, and therefore their best ships, their best commander, are not involved in the battle in a way they should be. After several days, with the French still holding Chesapeake Bay, Admiral Graves opted to preserve his badly damaged fleet. He disengaged and sailed back to New York. The battle was over. It was a tactical draw, but a strategic victory for the French. At its end, they still controlled the Chesapeake. History hasn't been kind to Admiral Graves, but he had the wit to realize that while Britain would survive the defeat of Cornwallis, it would be gravely damaged by the loss of his fleet. But Graves could not have realized that withdrawing his fleet would change the fate of North America. The English had controlled the American coast throughout the American Revolution. They will control it the year after 1781, but it is August and September 1781 where the British will really lose North America in many, many ways because of their failure to seize a tactical opportunity. And the French ability to control the Chesapeake means the Franco-American army can come down, can besiege uh, a Cornwallis, and the British kind of lose a, 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 a real desire. I mean, you look at what Graves does when he goes back to New York. He doesn't really try. It's as, almost as if the loss on September 5th means to him that, well, there's no sense in going back. But it's an irony, isn't it, that the decisive blow for American liberty is struck by the French? Without a doubt. I mean, America, the United States, the Continentals, do not have a navy. Never have a hope of having a navy. The English have gotten used to moving uh, their troops and fleets up and down whenever they will. The Americans have gotten used to the French not doing what the 
Americans want them to do. It is 1781 where all this comes together. With the French Navy now firmly in control of Chesapeake Bay, the stage was set for what would become the decisive battle of the war. The French unloaded their deadly cargo of siege guns onto the Virginia Peninsula. And Washington and Rochambeau began to assemble their land forces for the assault on Yorktown. Facing French ships, siege guns, and an allied army of 16,000 men, assembling here at Williamsburg, Cornwallis began his grim endgame. Less than 20 miles away from the French and American allied headquarters, Cornwallis and his army of 8,000 redcoats prepared to defend its Yorktown base. This would be a very different battle from his field campaigns. It was to be European-style siege warfare. By the 29th of September, the British had thrown up impressive defences, including ten redoubts, mounting 65 guns, here at Yorktown. That night, they gave up their outer defences. Cornwallis was outnumbered by at least three to one, and wanted to concentrate his forces in order to survive until relieved. Clinton had promised help by the 5th of October. This place is in no state of defense. Unless you can relieve me very quickly, you must be prepared to hear the worst. The Allies were already building a ring of heavy artillery, known as the First Parallel, around Cornwallis's defenses. The next step would be to cut zigzag trenches forward, and then complete a second parallel, tightening their grip on the British. On the 9th of October, the French and American forces were able to open fire from here, the first parallel, a 2,000-yard arc of trenches mounting siege guns like these monsters. They fired 32-pound balls that chewed up palisades and leveled earthworks. That night, 3,600 heavy shot crashed into Yorktown. <laughs> Chris Bryce, a ranger on the Yorktown battlefield, knows the effect such a bombardment would have had. You're obviously trying to, to maim, kill your, your enemy, but also uh, the demoralizing effect that one of these would have. If you're, you know, if you're under fire, not only from that, that hammering effect of those 18-pound, those 24-pound those siege guns, you know, having these mortar bombs uh, going off over your head you know, for nine days as the British suffer here, you know, that's got to take a lot out of you psychologically. So even if you you don't even hit a single person. The fact that uh, you know, you're having this day in and day out, um, it, it's got to have an impact. On the night of the 11th, the Allies dug 750 yards of the second parallel, only 350 yards from the British defences. To complete this second arc of artillery positions, they'd have to get rid of two outlying British forts, redoubts numbers 9 and 10. The attack on redoubt number nine took place under cover of darkness. It was a French assault. 400 Frenchmen against 120 British and Hessians. Halt! Who goes? The attackers lost men and time as their pioneers hacked their way through these wooden defenses. Then once they fought their way up onto the parapet, there was vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And some men bayoneted their friends in the dark. But the sheer weight of numbers wouldn't be denied. In half an hour, the French were masters of the place. The encirclement of the British was now complete. 
the redcoats in Yorktown were enduring all the horrors of an 18th century siege, so very like the trench warfare of the 20th century. One of them wrote, we get terrible provisions now, putrid meat and wormy biscuits that have spoiled aboard the ships. Men fall sick with bloody flux and dysentery. Foul fever is spreading. We get little rest by day or night. Soldiers and sailors deserted in large numbers. Bodies lay about the place, some with limbs or heads shot off. An American observed, the whole peninsula trembles with the incessant thundering of our infernal machines. Bickering between the British commanders in New York was delaying the vital rescue operation. Cornwallis wrote in despair to Clinton. The safety of this place is so precarious that I cannot recommend the fleet or the army should put themselves into any great danger in endeavouring to save us. So, what did you want the boat to The crisis was about to lead to the betrayal of some of Britain's most valuable and vulnerable allies. Cornwallis ejected 5,000 black auxiliaries, many ravaged by smallpox, into no man's land. They joined the British hoping for freedom. Now they face slavery again, or death. Defeat was staring Cornwallis in the face. But he made one last attempt to escape by slipping away north across the York River. On the night of the 16th, Tarleton, commanding the enclave of Gloucester on the far bank, sent over 16 boats, each capable of carrying 100 men. The first wave of 1,000 men got across safely. But then a tremendous storm blew up. By 6 in the morning, no more troops had crossed and those on the far side had had to be evacuated. Cornwallis's attempt at a Dunkirk had failed. He'd run out of options. At dawn on the 17th, the Allies recommenced their deadly bombardment. At about 10 o'clock, a British drummer mounted the parapet and beat the call for a parley. He was drowned out by the noise of the guns. Then an officer raised a white handkerchief. It was all over, bar the talking. As an American, this, this is where, where American independence is won. And for it to happen uh, just 23 miles from where it all began uh, in 1607 is, is one of the most remarkable things I, I can think of in, in association with the siege. To, you know, that they, it, they're in, in walking distance, uh, uh, if, if you will, of, of, of where uh, Britain started its dominance here in North America uh, 174 years earlier. This is still called Surrender Field. At the ceremony here, British fifes are said to have played a popular song called The World Turned Upside Down, an appropriate choice for an 18th century superpower. An American officer, St. George Tucker, witnessed the ceremony. Our army was drawn up in line on both sides of the road. French on one side, the Americans on the other. Through these lines, the whole of the British Army passed, their drums in front beating a slow march, their colours furled and cased. The sight was too pleasing to an American to admit of description. Hey, 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 hey. 
Cornwallis was ill that day, and his second in command, O'Hara, offered his sword to the French. For the British, this was a French, not an American victory. But the French refused. The surrender was to be taken by George Washington. It was one of the biggest British military defeats in history. Even though the peace wasn't signed until 1783, the American Revolutionary War ended at Yorktown. On the 25th of October, 1781, a British relief force arrived off the Chesapeake. It was one week too late. After the surrender, there was much of that elegant courtesy, so common in Europe, where officers were gentlemen, and war was often about politics, not patriotism. The British asked the French to lend them money for a lavish dinner for the officers of both sides. Rochambeau personally loaned Cornwallis £10,000. American officers declined to join the meal and looked on in amazement. The dinner represented in microcosm why the British had lost the war. For the Redcoats, it was a matter of honour and duty. But for the Americans, it had become a war of liberation and national identity. But what kind of nation were they building? In 1776, the Declaration of Independence had proudly affirmed that all men were created equal and were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, amongst them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But these rights would not apply to all Americans. Very few black Americans who'd fought for the rebels were offered freedom. Native American Indians would face near extinction in savage wars against the new nation. A hundred thousand American loyalists were forced to leave their country forever. And for the victors, would all the sacrifices ultimately prove to be worthwhile? As the first President of the United States, George Washington helped transform revolutionary fervor into sound government. But some of his French allies took that fervor back home. American victory sent shock waves right into the heart of the old world. And liberty? That's what American patriots and French revolutionaries thought they were fighting for. And it remains a noble ideal. But the American Revolution, like revolutions before and since, shows just what an elusive quality it really is.